to the uh, School of Public Affairs, Dr. Marks for Criminal Justice for that Corrections Panel. We have a few more panel members. Somehow I got lost, or they got lost, or whatever. Hopefully, we've got a couple more that will be showing up. Today, we're fortunate to have representatives from the State Department of Corrections, the Federal Department of Corrections, Federal Government through the United States Probation Office. State Probation should be here. We have the El Paso County Sheriff's Office at Concord. We have uh, Zeppelin Pike Detention Center. Uh, I'm waiting for word from someone from Spring Creek Correction Center to go. Uh, we're making it up, I'm sure. But I'm going to turn it over to our panel members, let them introduce themselves, give you some background information on themselves and the agency. And then uh, one of two things we can do is ask questions as they present. Or after you hear all of the presenters, you can individually ask them questions about their agency, you know, how they got to where they're at, uh, what you can look at in their career corrections. For me, I started off as a deputy sheriff in the general sheriff's department, worked there, and then moved on to state probation here in Colorado Springs as an adult probation officer, worked that for almost five years. Been appointed United States Probation Officer for the District of Colorado. Worked there for almost uh, 23 years, 23 and a half years. And then I hired these two and decided I better leave. So uh, I moved up from a line officer to a special offender specialist. From there to supervisor. And then the last six plus years was the deputy chief. So I retired as the Deputy Chief of the United States Probation Office and then started teaching five months after that. I wasn't smart enough to stay retired. I've been teaching now for about 15 and a half years. So that's my background in corrections. We have a very distinguished panel that's going to enlighten you as to their careers, their background, and so on. So I'm going to turn it over to Sean. I knew I should have said that. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Shelly Burke. I've been with the Community Corrections for 27 years, and I'd like to start by thanking all of you, and um, just for having the moral courage to step up and show an interest in the criminal justice system on any level, because um, it does take a lot of moral courage. It takes uh, a lot these days to get into this type of field. So thank you all for your interest, and uh, I also want to ask you because I was kind of thrown into this last late last night. I got a call, so I'm not really uh, so I've been with, did you want me to go on or do you want everybody to introduce yourself before I <coughs> Or you can one at a time. Okay, so I've, I've been with the division for a very long time and uh, I've watched the trajectory of the violence increase. Uh, this Zebulon Pike is unique. We're one of ten facilities throughout Colorado. We are very unique in that we have males only and we have committed only. Meaning that the youth have, they have extinguished pretty much all of their lower level services and they're committed so that they're, they're, it's a secure setting so they're not allowed to leave until the end of their stay. We provide transitional services, uh, we provide vocational. Uh, almost always a youth receives a GED or a diploma, which is, as you all know, a key to success. Uh, we, have, um, we have different populations these days. We see kids coming in now that would have gone to DOC for 10 to 15 years for some of their crimes. When I first started, we had status offenders and we had violence offenders, but they were on a very low level. So what we're seeing now is uh, our youth coming in that are much more violent. We have uh, sex offenders, these are the autism specific population. We have very uh, a lot of gang members, a lot of violence, we have mental health. We have a lot of substance abuse. I oversee the substance abuse slash facilities um, supervisor. So I work in all areas. We have a multidisciplinary team that consists of clinical. So if you're interested in the clinical aspect of working with these youth, we have security and we have education. So we have a multidisciplinary team that works together to try to establish a mindset where these kids can get out and uh, truly believe that they are worthy of something. So it's a very difficult population. We work closely with the community because we feel that in order to sustain what we've worked so hard 
partnership with the community. If you're interested in working um, more than just an individual on an individual basis and working to serve your community, DYC is definitely a place where you want to be. We do a lot of family services. Once these kids get out, we have to follow through. We have to stay connected to them. There are a lot of volunteer, a lot of faith-based organizations that work with us in order to sustain that because at the end of the day, these kids have been physically abused. Uh, most of them don't have parents. They, they have incarcerated parents. Most of them are fatherless or they have uh, substance abuse issues. So that sense of belonging is what they're looking for. And like I, I stated earlier, when I started this division, we used to be able to do crime on lights, sex offenders on one unit, mental health on the unit, gang and violence on another unit. And it's no longer like that. It's just a smorgasbord. It seems like everything is very complex. Individuals come in with all of these, and again, belonging to a gang is is the thing to do. That sense of belonging. If they're not a gang member when they, they come in, they eventually join the sunset, try to leave our facility and be part of that. So that violence is increasing, and that sense of belonging once they get out in, in the community is very critical. So we offer um, cognitive rehabilitative behavioral services, which essentially uh, is just trying to change their distorted thinking, the thought processes that they brought up with and how they use society and law enforcement to try to uh, help them change that and build self self-efficacy. We have a lot of uh, small successes in within the facility and we follow through and we celebrate that. We help them see themselves in a different light so that they can get out and be a productive member of society. We offer culinary, um, construction, vocational services. Toward the end of their stay, what is also very unique about Central and Pike as opposed to all the other facilities is that we are very transition based. So we try to get them into college. We have uh, former kids that are attending college right now. We try to get them into jobs so that we continue to be, have, they continue to have the constraints of GYC so we're monitoring their behavior and they don't have all that freedom, but they're experiencing success in college and in work. So they begin to feel that they can do it. And hopefully that sense of belonging sets into where they're not feeling like they need to be exploited by uh, predators that are out there waiting to grab them. Well, our age, our ages start at 12 up to 21, which is another uh, issue that we have is having that mixture of mental health and age groups. But once they get in there, if there isn't somewhere for them to feel like they belong in the support system, then they will quickly go back to the gang and, and the people here that are the are waiting to exploit them, give them that sense of belonging, and then use them to uh, pretty much share our regular society. So it's uh, there's a lot to offer at DYC, and yeah, it's the, the pay starts out at I believe 37, but for me, I think it's exactly what that, that was. It's about 37 a month. Uh, there's great benefits. Again, it is not for the pain hearted, there, there's a lot of violence, but there's a lot of success. Uh, so if you're interested in working, have to have the moral courage to come in and be friendly but not a friend, be able to set boundaries and limits of what they need more than anything, and uh, just be able to work in a team setting and a community setting and help us stay this. Hi, I'm Marcy Fox, I'm the assistant with deputy chief. Travis Cormany, he's the supervisor down here in the Colorado Springs office of the four offices within the District of Colorado. We have a Denver office, we have the office in Colorado Springs, we have the Durango office, and the Grand Junction office with two officers. Um, my background has been in the field, I want to say 23 years. I have an undergraduate degree in criminal justice, and then I got hired on to the halfway house, and I was a halfway house for three and a half years. Then I got hired in uh, a drug court with Denver Adult Probation in uh, Denver County. Then I worked as a probation officer for two years in a Denver district. Denver has Denver County. District probation is all felony offenses, and then county is all misdemeanor offenses. So Denver's the only county where it kind of splits it up into three different agencies. And then I got hired on and appointed as a federal probation officer 15 and a half years ago at the same time as Travis did. So we started on the same. Um, I started out 
in my career writing pre-sentence investigation reports, and then I moved over to supervision, I was a supervision officer for 12 years. Then I was promoted to a supervisor, and I supervised the pre-sentence unit and also the pretrial services part of the unit that the bail investigations. We'll talk about that here in a second. And now I've been the assistant deputy chief over the supervision unit since December of last year. I supervise all the supervisors that supervise the supervision unit. A lot of work there. Um, so we're split into two divisions in our office. We have the supervision unit, which supervises both pretrial defendants that are pending cases in front of the federal courts, and also post-conviction offenders, which is either on supervision for probation offenses or coming out of prison on what we call supervised release. We do still have some parole cases, but parole was abolished in the federal system years ago, even though they were talking about bringing it back, so we have a different component than um, state parole and Department of Corrections because our people are not on parole, so they're treated a little bit differently than inmates are what they call the Department of Corrections. So just trying to stay this part of it. Thank you. Good. All right. I will uh, take it over for a minute. Like Marcy said, we'll be doing some probation. I'm Travis Corbin, I'm the supervisor here in Colorado Springs. And we'll give you a, a quick down and dirty about our agency and what we do. Uh, probation is pretty similar across the state as far as working with offenders. Uh, like Marcy said, we're really unique in the fact that uh, the majority of the folks we work with are coming out of prison. Uh, although we are not called parole officers, that is uh, more of what we do. Who we are, uh, the federal law enforcement officers, but we are under the judiciary branch, which is different than your traditional federal law enforcement. We're all under executive branch. Uh, we work for the courts, so our bosses are essentially uh, the judges. Our main mission, uh, we supervise persons suspected, charged, or convicted against the United States. What we do, we have three major departments within our department, I guess divisions within our department. And Marcy and I will give you kind of specifics on each one. We've got our free trial services department, which deal with folks that have been charged or indicted under federal crime. Our free sense investigation uh, officers, to investigate and create a report to be used for sentencing on an individual. And then our supervision officers who essentially supervise uh, folks on probation or supervised release, hence coming in. Requirements uh, for our career, uh, college degree. Uh, majority of our officers have master's degrees. It used to be a uh, requirement, it is no longer a requirement, but it is such a competitive field out there that a lot of folks are getting master's degrees just to get their application higher on the stack. Uh, we do have some officers that have uh, law degrees, JPs. Um, we found that beneficial because we do work so closely with the courts and law attorneys. In federal probation, in our hiring practices, we look for the folks who have uh, some years of experience in the judicial or criminal justice related field. Um, it helps if you've had some sort of uh, experience in criminal justice work. We all have to go under a, we all have to undergo a background or security clearance to get these jobs. Uh, they're pretty extensive. They're looking at social history, your education history, your drug history, asking questions about that. Something to think about. Uh, we are uh, armed officers, so we carry firearms. Who we work with, uh, it's pretty unique. Uh, we get a chance to work with you know, the United States Attorney's Office pretty closely as they uh, indict and charge individuals with federal crimes, uh, federal public defenders, uh, obviously your executive law enforcement agencies like FBI, DEA, ATF, and so on. Those are the folks that uh, are 
investigating and charging these individuals. And then once they are charged with felony crime, they enter our world, and we get them on the front end and the back end when they get out of prison. Uh, the United States Marshal Service, we work pretty closely with that agency as they are in charge of court security, transportation, and executing our warrants. So if we have an individual abscond from federal supervision, we work with the Marshal Service, the United States. So as I touched on before, um, in the District of Colorado, we are combined. Um, some of the districts are 24 districts in the federal system. And some of them have a separate pretrial services office, and some of them have a separate probation office, but we're combined. We've been combined for quite a long time, um, since the 90s. And what the pretrial services officers do, um, once somebody comes in on an arrest, they will interview them and write a report that's usually about five pages long criminal background investigation, interview, interview them about their residence, their family history, and then try to contact the collateral sources that they can to verify the information. And then they're going to write a report and give it to the magistrate judges. So we have magistrate judges and district court judges, our legal three judges. They'll write it up for the magistrate judge, um, do an extensive background check on them, and type it up in a format that says you know, if they have convictions, if they know who they're here, and everything. And what they're pretty much determining to the judge on whether the person should be released on bond pending trial or if they should be detained um, pending their case. Most cases don't go to trial, most cases get fought out, but so we call it pending trial, so it's always going to have a release out. Um, also, if we're recommending a release on bond for somebody, we're going to recommend release conditions. And on the pretrial side, we try to be least restrictive duty conditions. So what are the least restrictive conditions you recommend? supervised on so sometimes though that might include being on an ankle monitor so we track them on the ankle monitor and that can be your electronic or gps so that they can actually map them in their options so typically when we get cases that are going for sexual offending or child pornography cases they're required to go on a gps monitor um, we also have the advantage of having um, three halfway houses here in colorado that we utilize so some of our people So as I touched on earlier too, if somebody gets released on bond, then typically our supervision officers will see those cases while pending um, What we do when we supervise them in public, we make sure that they comply with the conditions of release that we just talked about. Um, we monitor them by going to see them at their home, their employment. Um, while they're on free trail, they're not required because they haven't been convicted yet. Not required to tell their employer that they're pending in the case, that they've been arrested for in the case. So if they haven't told their employer yet, we can't go out to the employer. If we can do it covertly and see them at the employment, that's fine, but we can't tell their employer that they're pending in the case. Uh, we also do collateral contacts and monitor them through family members um, and treatment providers. So if we have recommended treatment and they're attending treatment, we'll go out and talk to the treatment provider. Um, send reports to the court on them and uh, travel will always restrict to the District of Colorado because it's within the state. If they want to travel outside the state, they have to have permission from the court on a free trial site. So they're turning them into file motion asking for them to leave the state. And then any violations that they have on bond, we report to both the United States Attorney who's prosecuting the case and also to the judge that released them, uh, the magistrate judge that released them on
once they pled guilty or have been found guilty at trial, the case gets assigned to one of our investigation officers to do a pre-sentence investigation report. Our pre-sentence investigation reports are pretty lengthy. Typically, they're at least 20 pages in length. Um, it's kind of split amongst our judges. Some of our judges allow us to do an investigation of what that means if we're the U.S. Attorney's Office and read through their entire files and look to see some judges we don't do that. So we'll go through the entire plea agreement and meetings and reiterate that in the pre-sentence investigation report. We give you a criminal background check and write that up to the judge. We interview the offender typically that lasts for over an hour when we go out to interview them in jails or in person. We get financial documentation for them to look up to the plea report. Um, interview family members, anything that we can verify, uh, military records, employment history, all that goes into the report, and then we make recommendation for sentencing. We have federal sentencing guidelines, and so we have a big book that kind of tells us a guideline range of imprisonment to recommend, and we try to go with that. That's based on their criminal history. You get points for your criminal history score, and then you get um, points based on what the offense of is. So it's kind of this weird combination that comes up in the settlements. And then also, federal statute will give you a recommendation. So again, we'll recommend a sentence to the judge, and then if they're looking at prison sentence, we'll recommend conditions for supervised release once they get released out of prison. Um, if we're recommending probation, the same thing. They're essentially the same conditions whether they are on supervised release or probation. So again, we look at whether they have a history of substance abuse and we'll recommend treatment, mental health, medication, on these um, restrictions such as their contact with um, certain people and no alcohol. We also have a search condition uh, that allows us to, if we have reasonable suspicion, go out and search the residence. So we do that from time to time also. Probably our biggest division in our office are, is our supervision side. And that's our supervision officers. Uh, they usually supervise a combo of defendants and offenders. And when we say defendants, it's essentially the folks that have been indicted not have, been, have not been convicted. And then we talk about offenders are the folks that have been convicted uh, are coming out of prison and or replaced on probation by the court. Marcy touched on this, but essentially when we're working with folks that are on supervision, we're going to enforce conditions, and they can be a variety of different things, uh, weapons restrictions, drug and alcohol testing if those are prior uh, problems for that individual, uh, location monitoring, GPS monitoring, uh, search and seizure, uh, mental health, uh, there's situations there. We also help with uh, medications if an individual needs psychiatric medication, uh, community service, child support, uh, sex offender conditions, population that we have to work with uh, to ensure that they're uh, doing what they need to do. Restitution, uh, we ensure that restitution payments are being uh, made. Travel restrictions, association restrictions, if they have gang ties, we try to monitor that, separate them from their uh, prior gang ties. And the cool part, uh, how are we trained? And this has changed a little bit since I was in the field. It changed a lot. Uh, we've actually created, uh, the system has created a, a six-week program uh, at a let's see, uh, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, and the one we use is in South Carolina. It's a six-week program where they teach you how to safely perform all the information and supervision responsibilities, including uh, use of firearms and officer response tactics. And what that means is the hand-to-hand, empty-hand -hand, uh, -hand control that you were being involved with. Finally, the comments of the center. Uh, more pictures about Plessy. Our offensive ground kind of response tactics, again, teach you how to deal with an aggressive offender. Uh, we also teach folks how to handle uh, handcuffs, whether it's compliant or not compliant handcuffing. Like I said before, uh, we teach individuals how to handle firearms if they don't have prior exposure to that. Uh, through that 
that six weeks, you get almost daily uh, firearm uh, training in addition. I mean, they go through a litany of stuff. We teach folks how to testify, how to write reports, how to conduct interviews, how to uh, solicit disclosures. Uh, once you're in our system, uh, we continue to train you. Uh, we offer various training throughout the fiscal year. Our folks get anywhere from 40 to 80 hours of training yearly. Uh, we do a lot of in-house training, and then we send a lot of, of our officers uh, across the country to be trained on whatever the latest and greatest issues are going on out there. So that essentially is a quick presentation on U.S. probation. I brought some uh, pamphlets. I'll be here. You're welcome to grab if you're, if you're interested in reading more about what we do. Does anybody have any questions about our agency or what we offer? The only thing kind of to add, and Travis kind of said this earlier, we're a very unique judicial alliance. Even though we work with um, executive branch people, which is like ATF, FBI, Secretary of CIA, but we still have to be hired by age 37. So
I'll take over after that. The first one I wanted to do was is there's two people here I want to give a shout out to that work for us as correctional technicians, Amber Allred and Robert Fuller. Go ahead and just raise your hands. <laughs> I wanted to say thank you to both of them. Are you guys from the senior year yet? You are. Amber? Not yet. Okay. How many people here in the room are in your last year? Okay, so you are really interested in what we have to say today because you need a job. When? Next May? You guys graduating in May? Okay. So, theory is, is you've gone to school for four years, uh, you're interested in the criminal justice system, it has a broad range of possibilities. Uh, to just talk about how Comp Corps fits into that broad range of possibilities. So we kind of fit, we're kind of sandwiched in between everybody else here on the panel. So, for example, law enforcement is going to attach them. They are going to go to court. They will get sentenced. When they get sentenced, they could come to cop court first, depending on what that sentence is. We have a diversion program. Uh, typically, what it was set up for was is people who were first-time offenders. They thought, well, instead of putting them into prison, they've got a first-time offense, could we try a community placement? And that diversion program is going to come first. People come to us for typically a stay of six to nine months that they stay residential. If they're a diversion client, the idea is that they could graduate from being residential, going into a non-residential program, and then be able to complete their sentence on a non-residential sentence. So some of those individuals that we come through the system will come to us in that particular way. The other major source is people that are coming out of transition. So Corrections has individuals when they get closer to their their release date, they can become eligible in, in conjunction with their case manager. Those individuals are judged suitable for a placement in the community. And the concept is is rather than just taking someone and releasing them on a given day, you know, putting them at a particular spot. What if they did a transitionary phase? What if they came to a more structured environment? And then we're able to do some things with us to prepare them for going out, potentially on parole. A lot of the individuals that we have either graduate from us going out on potentially an ISP or going out on, on parole. So the idea is, is we're kind of at somewhere near the beginning and somewhere near the end in terms of what we do. Our function is a little bit different. Uh, the, the other individuals here, they're kind of into the, either the penalty or the post penalty phase. We're really oriented to trying to say, how do we get them going in society and working? So I will admit, first thing, not everyone that gets into either one of these systems is going to be suitable for community placement. Obviously, uh, good people at all stages of this particular system have decided, hey, you know what, community might be the way to go with this particular individual. Uh, she talked about the services that we provide. <coughs> Interestingly enough, in the state of Colorado, when they created community corrections, they decided that part of the toll, i.e. the cost, should be paid for by the individuals. And so we have a circumstance where we actually charge them rent, interestingly enough. So uh, in our case, a statute that is $17 a day, for which they receive three meals a day. Uh, they are also potentially able to use our vocational department. Uh, they are able to do counseling. And then for some folks, if they have specialized needs, also have specialized programs for either mentally ill individuals. Typically they are newly diagnosed, so they're probably going to have a substance abuse and a mental health problem. Uh, the others that just have a substance abuse problem they have an intensive residential treatment program. So we're trying to kind of meet all the different needs. It is a huge focus for us vocational. And one of the advantages that Comcore has is that we've been here in this community for over 30 years. And as a consequence, we get good Contacts and one of the things that I'm particularly proud of because I get to supervise it is our vocational department. And at this point in time, all the clients that are with us right now, about 85% of them have a job. So that's kind of a big deal. Uh, and one of the things we think is, is you have to start somewhere. So unfortunately, for some of them, these are probably not career opportunities, but they are bridges to build for their future. And so the idea is that everyone on staff is there to kind of support that process of them getting their treatment, them getting a job, and also trying to get them out into society. One of the 
other exciting things about what we do is, is that the individuals that come into our program, it's really all about what they do with it. So it's very exciting what can happen with individuals. Uh, one of my favorite stories is an individual who is now a millionaire, who was a ordinary criminal and got into community corrections. Uh, he changed his life around when he finally got what the problem was and what he needed to do. And uh, these folks, they have skills. And not all of them are necessarily antisocial. Uh, this individual was a fantastic speaker and also a bit of a salesman. So he is now an inspirational, motivational speaker and uh, talks to people and does, does other things. And of course, I'm completely jealous because he has a house in Bali. So the thought here is, is that the people that are coming into this system, what are the potentials? Well, this guy was an ordinary criminal. He changed his life. And now he's an inspirational speaker. And he's a person who gives back. He actually comes and visits us at times and talks to these people. So now, what does all that great stuff mean to you? Well, I see Comcore as kind of a place to cut your teeth. Because obviously, uh, we're a private not-for-profit. And to be honest, I can't compete with anybody else on this panel in terms of pay. I mean, I, I, I can get relatively close, but I cannot compete. But the idea is, is uh, some people, if you are into the concept of a not-for-profit, if you want to come and work with us and learn some things so that eventually you can graduate and go on with these other careers, and I will tell you that right now, I know people, because I've been with Concord 26 years, that are working for each of these agencies that originally started with us. And unfortunately, Roderick and Amber may be leaving us at some time, but that's okay. I'm thinking you might, when you get your degree, who knows, maybe it'll be fun. I don't know. Okay. But the thought is, is that it's an opportunity for people. The other thing I talked to you about being seniors, even if you're a senior, but especially if you're not, Comcore employs people uh, part-time. So you can come in, get some good professional training. Uh, you're going to learn a lot of concepts. Uh, how many of you have heard the concept of EVP? Anybody know what EVP is here? Evidence-based practice? All right, there's a hand. Uh, it is a new concept. Or relatively, it's been around for a while, but it is a concept that is permeating through all of corrections and a lot of other things. Evidence-based practices is what EVP stands for. And the concept is, is let's try and focus on what works. And so Comcore is there looking to train people. Amber, have you been to a motivational interview? Not yet, but Not yet. Say. How about you, Robert? Uh, Not yet. yet. They're both going to have opportunities to, to go to some classes and learn about uh, another technique of motivational interviewing. How many of you have heard of that? I know some of the people on the panel here have had it. So you would have an opportunity coming to work for us part time to learn about some of these concepts and do some other things. And you could end up like I did, which is, is I came and started with the company and thought, well, I'll be here for a while and then I'll move on. Uh, you come. Stay sometimes because you like the environment, you like what we do, and it's a little bit different than what everybody else here in the room is doing. So we would be very excited uh, for any or all of you to contact us and talk about employment opportunities either now or when you graduate. Uh, we talked about the correctional side. We also have the case management side uh, where individuals are working with individual clients, we develop case plans for them, move them through various stages of development and progression. And of course, the neat thing is, is there's a light at the end of the tunnel for these individuals, especially when they're in a community place. So we, we have graduates, and, and some of them do quite well. So um, without any further ado, I guess they say, is there, are there any questions I can answer for you? Um, certainly, we'll be here and available. We have, uh, I've got a stack of business cards, kind of the old school way of Certainly, excited uh, if any of you would like to get that card and find out some things. And now you got a couple classmates who work at Concord who so can tell you a little bit more. You guys, we also provide internship services as well for graduate and undergraduate students. So if you guys are interested, you guys can contact us as well um, and visit our website www.concord.org. Yeah. All right, I'm uh, Rick Ramish. I'm the executive director. Colorado Department of Correction. Recent research says that if 
be sitting a total of eight hours a day, but smoking a bag of cigarettes, or if you all want to stand up, that's okay with me. Um, let, me give you a, let me give you my background. I started as a deputy sheriff in Dane County, Wisconsin, which is where Madison, Wisconsin is. I did that for 11 and a half years. The last seven and a half of those years, I was an undercover narcotics detective. I was also called to investigate homicides. Also, at that time, I was on the uh, scuba dive rescue and recovery team. Um, after that, I, uh, the last four of those seven and a half years, I also attended University of Wisconsin Law School. I tell people I graduated cum laude on a Sunday. On Monday, I joined the Dane County District Attorney's Office as an assistant district attorney. At that time, there was very little training. I was given 500 cases, and I used to call it trial by disaster. Uh, did that for a while, and then became an assistant, district, an assistant U.S. attorney for the Western District of Wisconsin. Did that for a while, then I was asked to put my name in the ring to become Dane County Sheriff, as the current sheriff at that time was retiring. He retired, I got the position, I did that, I was appointed, then elected and re-elected for four terms. Um, after that, I became, uh, went out in the private sector for a while, then went back into government, became administrator of probation and parole for the Wisconsin Department of Correction, which is a much larger system. Uh, then here we had 22,000 inmates, 75,000 on probation and parole, 22,000 sex offenders, and 1,000 juveniles. I uh, did that for a while, then was appointed uh, deputy secretary, uh, which is the second in command for corrections. Did that for a while, then was appointed secretary, so I ran the uh, Wisconsin Department of Corrections. Then when the uh, new governor came in, he and I agreed on one thing. He didn't want me working for him, and I didn't want to work for him either, so I left. Became dean of a college in Madison, about 40,000 students, where I oversaw police, fire, and EMS students. And then something happened that frankly uh, ticked me off. Uh, my predecessor here was assassinated, and I got mad, and I was asked to apply for the job, and I did. And here I am. So uh, that's my background, and now that you know that I can't keep a job, uh, <laughs> the other thing is. The reason I, I mention my background is because of any questions in the criminal justice system, I've obviously been in a number of different areas and would be, would be happy to answer them. Uh, the Colorado Department of Corrections, we have over 6,200 employees. My budget's over $850 uh, million. We have about 20,000 inmates and about uh, 9,000 on probation and parole. 20 prisons, 18 parole offices. And I'll give a bigger picture. One is, just completely stop listening to me right now if you don't believe people can change. Because if you don't believe that, then you don't want to be in this business. Uh, because they can change. Uh, we have so many different areas. The other thing about my background, I think if I would have joined corrections at the start of my career, I would have stayed in corrections because there's so many fascinating areas to work. We need great correctional officers. We need great parole officers, clinicians, case managers, re-entry specialists, mental health specialists, you name it, we have it. Um, you want to chase bad guys and bad girls, we have a fugitive apprehension unit that chase people all over the U.S., sometimes outside of the country. Uh, we have those that work diligently with inmates trying to get them to change their behavior. Our concept, our philosophy is that people are sent to prison as punishment, not for punishment, once they get to us. So everything we do is to try and get them ready to go back into society better than when they came in. 97% of our inmates will be returning to the community. I won't ask you how many of you know someone that's been uh, in prison or is in prison that you know personally. I do. Uh, the thing about your age right now and the opportunity this is the most exciting time to be in the criminal justice system that I've seen in almost 40 years of being in that system. Why? Those of us in the criminal justice system, a good number of us, are tired of mass incarceration. We're tired of over-arrest. We're tired of returning to the system. When I ran Wisconsin, which was back in oh, 2008 to 2011 as the, as the secretary, if you were the child of an incarcerated parent, stood a 67% more chance of being incarcerated yourself. You know what it is now? 70%. We're going in the wrong direction. I had 
the opportunity, and I got I got a great job. A good part of my job is the opportunities presented to me are absolutely tremendous. I have traveled the United States speaking about our reforms. I have assisted the State Department with the UN in Cape Town, South Africa, in Vienna. I'm appearing before the UN next month. I've talked in Australia. I was supposed to be in Romania this year. Wonderful opportunities. Now, the bad part about my job, if you think, God, I'd like to have this job. My professional lifespan is 1.8 years. 1.8. And why is that? Because we deal with disaster. Bad things happen in my world every single day. And if it gets bad enough, I'm at the whim of the governor. I could be fired right now and not know until I get back to the office. We get thrown under the bus when a disaster occurs on occasion. I've got a great governor. I've been here three years as of last year. I figure I'm living on my own time, so I can do anything I want right now. Um, when I talk about our opportunities, you know, you kind of got to throw your misconceptions about corrections out the door. Uh, I bet you don't know we have 3,000 wild horses. I bet you don't know that we have the largest water buffalo herd in the United States. I wouldn't suggest it, but I'll pay you if you want to try to milk one. Um, <laughs> We have one of the largest correctional industry programs in the United States, and when you hear somebody talk about slave labor in prisons and all that crap, uh, the fact of the matter is we have lines of inmates waiting to get into these professions because if we teach them to be a welder, they have a job in a minute, they step out of the institutions that they want, and they become a heavy equipment operator. We have all kinds of jobs. We have over 200 programs available to them. Our job is to, is to make them better. Water buffalo herd, why do we have that? Well, their milk is sought after for gourmet mozzarella cheese. Um, it's as simple as that. We make dumpsters for the Forest Service. Um, they're tested by a grizzly bear in Montana called Sam. If Sam can't get in the dumpster in 10 minutes, the Forest Service buys it. So we've got all these really interesting things. I bet you don't know that we have 31 countries coming to us to be trained in different aspects of corrections. 31. We are the largest partner with the State Department in the United States. Uh, we run classes 49 weeks out of the year uh, Afghanistan, Tunisia, Morocco, the Caribbean countries, Pakistan, Palestine. Um, and just having those people come to us is absolutely fascinating to listen to them and to help them um, do corrections in, in their country. Um, the opportunities are wonderful. You know, I'll give you a quick example of, of how we can have an impact and how I expect you to have an impact if you go into this field. I visited uh, the system in Sweden that they had come and taken a look at us and we took a look at them. And uh, Nils Ober, the director um, of their system, he oversees what we would consider the county jail system, state system, and the federal system. He has all those prisons and jails. Sweden has a population of about 10 million people. Sweden has an incarcerated population of about 5,000 people. Colorado has a population of about 5.5 million people. I just run the state prison system, and I have almost 20,000 people. Now, when I talk about this, I say I met a lot of Swedes when I was in Sweden. They were really nice people, but they didn't seem nicer than Coloradans. And so the point is, what the heck are we doing? And, and if you go into the system, what I would ask of you is ask, what the hell are we doing? Because I ask that, there's a danger in bureaucracy. That they start doing things that become accepted practice. And when you get there, into these systems, and you do, with a fresh set of eyes, do what I did when I got here. I looked around and I said, when did it become okay to lock someone in a 7 by 13 foot cell for 23 hours a day for over 20 years? And when did it become okay to lock someone in a 7 by 13 foot cell for years and then release them directly into the community? I heard stories when I got here that and that's always two correctional officers who take someone out of solitary confinement when they had completed their sentence, including the one that 
assassinated my predecessor. He spent seven years in SAG and, and was re released directly into the community. They would go to these cells, take the individual out, put him in street clothes, put him in manacles, chains, belly chains, arms handcuffed, leg chains, shuffle them on the public transportation, take those chains off, and get off the bus. And I said, if I was the bus driver, I'd stand up and at the top of my lungs scream, Run! What the hell is the matter with us? And at what time did it become okay to take someone that was mentally ill and put them in a 7 by 13 foot cell for 23 hours a day by themselves and let the demons chase them around in that cell? That was us. We did that. This is America. And we thought that was okay. And so when you get into these positions, it's not okay. We changed that in Colorado. And that's the exciting thing about being change managers, taking risks, is we have done things that no other state in the United States has done. We stopped all of that. And now, what I told my administrators, you want to lead or you want to be forced to follow. And now, the rest of the United States is trying to catch up to it. And the courts are, are making states do this. Consent decrees, lawsuits, and we are the national leader in segregation reform. And that's why I'm speaking everywhere about what we're doing because people didn't think we could do it. You know what? Our, our system's safe. Our assaults on staff are the lowest since 2006. The other thing about corrections, I stand up and Anybody in my position in any state can say the same thing. I run the largest mental health institution in the, in the state of Colorado. The, the myth that we deinstitutionalized the mentally ill is a myth. We didn't deinstitutionalize them. We shut down the mental hospitals. And they started that short walk from the hospital to the prison system. And I got it. And so now we've dedicated two of our facilities to the mentally ill. And I banned solitary at both those facilities. One of the sergeants, really good sergeant, they have great employees, it's a great place to work. He emailed my deputy and said, you're going to get someone killed. Six months later, I had a professor from Cornell out going through one of these facilities. That same sergeant was out there. And unsolicited, the professor said, so with these reforms, have the incidents of drop? So he kind of smiled and said, yes. By how much? 80%. Think of that. So, question, like I did, if you see something where you say in the back of your mind, what the hell are we doing? That needs to be done in bureaucracy. Because bureaucracy is going to get out of control, and it got out of control in every state in the United States. And we're trying to fix that right now. And Colorado leads the way, and that's the exciting thing about about these positions. And if you don't think one person can change what, what's going on in the world for internal purposes to try and change the way the culture that we had for over 100 years in Colorado Corrections, I decided for internal purposes to spend the night in solitary confinement as an inmate. And I did. And I took some notes. And when I came out, I thought, as I wrote those notes up, this may have more to it than I think. The article that I wrote for our internal newsletter ended up as an op-ed in the New York Times, and my world absolutely exploded because I didn't realize at the time that no one in my position had ever done it. I've been in and out of solitary cells hundreds of times, but I'd never spent three shifts, and I'd never slept in one where I didn't sleep that night either, but that's another story. But, um, it had never been done, and, and there are those that say that that started the national debate on the overuse of solitary confinement. I don't agree with that. I think the debate was, was already going on in some circles, but it sure threw one heck of a bucket of gas in that. And that's the exciting part about what we can do in these positions. Our job is to change people's lives, and there is no bigger thrill than being out on the street and having someone you don't even recognize walk up to you and go, man, you know what you said to me five years ago just completely turned me 
figure out. He has no idea where it was, he said. But it worked. And with these folks coming back, it's up to us to ensure that we do everything that we can to help them succeed. And that's the exciting thing about these positions. Uh, mixed in with tragedies, because tragedies occur. I have Crowley um, kill an infant a couple days ago. Um, bad things happen because we're dealing with bad people. Uh, the, the thing we have to do is take those bad people coming back, folks, 97 percent now, anyway. We have, because of our reforms right now, um, if you're aware of what a supermax prison is, it's a whole prison. We've got one that will hold a thousand people in segregation and solitary 23 hours a day. It's pretty new. It's empty. If you want to buy it, let me know. Our other supermax is now repurposed in the general population. And in the past, when you walked into a supermax, if people always want to see it because I don't know what they think they're going to see, they don't see anything. If they see anything, it's going to be one guy, an inmate, being shuffled down the hallway by, by two correction officers. But you're going to hear things. And what you're going to hear is screaming and kicking and banging and throwing and smashing your head against the wall because these folks are being mistreated in these cells. They, they have no idea when they're coming out. I talked to an individual that had been in one cell for 15 years. And we had some that went for over 20. And the person in for 15, I might add that our that our supermax, when I got here, I discovered that two years prior to me getting here, our outdoor recreation in that supermax was declared unconstitutional. And that outdoor recreation consisted of a 7 by 13 foot segregation cell with nothing in it but a chimp bar and a screen window on the side of the wall about this wide and about this tall, which meant that for 15 years the sun never touched that individual skin. Can you imagine that? Yet we thought that was an unallowed practice. We did that. We did it. Shame on us. And so we changed all that. And we changed the way the United States handles you saw where President Obama talked about reforming the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I can tell you where a lot of that came from, the state of Colorado, because they were calling us, they were visiting us, they saw what we were doing that they thought nobody could do, and we did it. And so that's the exciting, fascinating thing about, about correction, but you really got to believe there's a, this is great for Colorado. I love this. I'm obviously from Wisconsin, but you've all heard the adage that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Everybody's heard that. BS. You pick that horse up, you throw him in the pond, and I guarantee they're going to get some water just trying to get the hell out of the pond. And we've started some of our programs like that, and you know what? They're working. We are taking the most high risk, difficult inmates that you can stamp return to prison on their forehead putting them into a re-entry unit, and they're buying into it. And they're changing the way they think. Because we're taking the time to try and change the way they do business. So, um, I've used my time up, but uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions when we're done here. So I'll stay as long as you want, because this is just the fact that you have an interest in coming into a system at a time when the police and the communities and the detention um, all over the United States, but it's the old, when I see things like this happening, I don't get discouraged. I, I truly believe, never waste a crisis. I think when this is all said and done, we're going to be a stronger criminal justice system, we're going to be a better criminal justice, justice system, and we're going to be giving the community more of what they want and deserve. So that's, that's my speech. Thanks. Thank you. 
education officer for nine years. I actually started in Pueblo, um, where I supervised uh, violent sex offenders. Um, just recently promoted two years ago to Colorado Springs. That was a big change for me, Pueblo being a very small district um, compared to Colorado Springs, but it's a great transition. So I currently supervise general adults and our private probation, which is TI on the upper liaison there. Um, with state probation, kind of what's different from federal probation is we have 22 different districts in Colorado, but 23 departments. So because Denver County is so large, they broke in Denver County up into two. So you have Denver Adult and Denver Juvenile. So that's where the difference is. Um, in the fourth, uh, Colorado Springs, uh, we have about a hundred and about a hundred probation officers. We actually, I'm currently on the hiring board right now. We're actually going to hire ten um, as of next week. So I'll be doing that all next week. We had 287 applicants. So um, that was quite a process looking through all of those applications. So um, that was. There's a there's. You guys are in the right field because there's always a need for a probation officer and there's a high need and there's a lot of districts. I, I can't tell you how often I look at the careers on the you know state government website. There's always hiring for probation officers all over the state of Colorado. So you guys are definitely in the right field. Um, one of the other things is in our district there's several different units. So you have anywhere from the DUI unit, just DUI evaluations. So if someone gets a DUI, you come and we get evaluated. If you get placed on probation, there's a DUI unit where you get supervised. You have a pre-sentence investigation unit where if the courts order a pre-sentence investigation, you get sentenced to PSI. Someone will evaluate you and conduct a PSI interview. Um, you have the juvenile unit, where strictly officers supervise juveniles. You have just the general adult unit, that's probably one of the largest, as I was uh, probation had indicated, um, one of the largest units. You have um, ISP probation, or now what we call LSIP, which is more of your high criminal thinking, low substance abuse, or low need. So those are the ones that are high antisocial thoughts, but low need. Like, when I say low need, I mean low substance abuse, low um, mental health, low homeless needs, low those types of needs. But high criminal thinking. Like, oh, there's a car that has its keys in it. They shouldn't have left it like that, so they wanted me to steal it. That criminal thinking. Um, then you have sex offenders. Uh, that population. You have uh, domestic violence. You have uh, that population. Um, I think I already said juvenile. I like those are all hallways of the different ones. Um, victim services officers. We have our volunteer unit. Um, they're always looking for volunteers. Ray Sam Stevens is currently um, our victim service officer who is supervising that case, so he's always looking for volunteers. We definitely appreciate our volunteers. You actually get so much experience with that. You go to court, you're seeing clients, you're writing complaints, you're doing pretty much everything an officer is doing. So we really, really, really do appreciate our volunteers. Um, out of those things, um, the units, um, we also have our specialized <coughs> units, our alcohol and drug court. We have our veterans court. We have our um, heels court, so our alcohol and drug courts, those specialize just specifically um, alcohol and drug needs, but we also have our heels court, which is a little bit more intense alcohol and drug, where that specifically just drives, it's a little bit more intense than drug and alcohol court, if that's, if I can define that better. They're more in, impatient, that drives, they're unable to with their terms and conditions of probation based on the fact 
other drug and alcohol use. Where alcohol and drug court is they, um, they have other issues, but they're able to maintain in the community, if that makes any sense. Um, so those are your specialized courts. Uh, I think that's it. If I am missing one, I do apologize. Some of the other things is, since I've been in probation for nine years, things have really, really taken a shift. It used to be when I started, if someone came in high on drugs, we arrest them. Warrantless arrest, let's get them in. Call the sheriff of the crown, do a warrantless arrest, have a judge sign it, we just have to make them in custody. You know, or I went to a sex offender's house, found some porn, right away, I arrested them. That was it. Um, now, it's more of a treatment type. That's where they're talking about those evidence based practices, those uh, best practices, where, where it's really the is there a risk? So we are really looking at those based on their assessments. What type of risk are they in the community? What is their need? And also we're looking at incentives. What means a lot to them? So now if someone comes in and they came in and said, hi, man, uh, I used math two days ago. We may say, okay, using our MI skills, our motivational interviewing skills, knowing the history of the client, tell me why you used. Well, um, I got into a fight with my wife. Um, she spent all of her money on her, her, her check on um, makeup. Okay, tell me how that makes you feel. I feel frustrated. I'm trying to pay the bill, I'm trying to do what I'm supposed to do, blah, 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 okay? Tell me what we talked about before. Tell me, and so we get more talking to them about that. And based on our conversation before, we may say, tell me about what sanctions we talked about. If you used, what was the sanction that you said would fit best if you used? Well, we talked about if I used again, I would go to five A or five NA classes, or I would go to a um, drug and alcohol, or I'm sorry, a um, graduation for a um, drug court to see what a graduation looked like, or I would go to five extra treatment classes. Okay. You had picked that sanction before. So do you think you should do that? Yeah. Or I would go to an extra individual class for my substance abuse. Okay. So we would enforce that sanction. If that didn't work, and he continued to use, then of course we would increase those sanctions to where we would need to take the type of law enforcement type of where we would need to arrest him, get him back into court, you know, get a higher level of treatment based on his assessment and his risk and his need to the community and the safety. So we've taken kind of a different approach. So based on his risk and what he's reporting is the problem <coughs> and the need, we really want to work with the client to be successful. So it's not just about with what the terms and conditions of probation say, it's really what is successful for them after they get off probation. What's going to be successful after? What's going to work for them after they get off probation? Also. So, um, we're really looking at rewards too. We have kind of moved to um, what's rewarding for them. If they go to so many treatment classes or they have five clean UAs, hey, I'll pay for the next UA, or I'll pay for the next treatment. We have a better service funds. I'll pay for it, you know? My officers will come to me and say, hey, Leanne, um, this guy graduated his COG class. All right, let's get him some from Goodwill. Let's buy him five new pairs of jeans for work. All right, I'll sign off on it, you know? So we incentivize them to keep them going. I mean, we don't like nice things, right? Like, I know I go to work because I have to pay the bills, but I like my paycheck, too. So let's, you know, I have children, you know. If they do get A's on the report card, I'm going to reward them. So 
those types of things. Um, so those are things that we're really looking at doing, is taking that different approach with probation. Um, so, so those are some of the things, like I talked to you guys about assessments. If they're saying that, hey, I have a problem with substance abuse, if, back nine years ago when I started, it was like, okay, we're going to start with outpatient treatment. Because that's where we start. And then we try outpatient treatment, we wait for them to fail, and then we move to intensive outpatient treatment, and then we move to inpatient treatment. We don't really do that anymore. What we really do is we do an assessment. If they need intensive outpatient treatment, we start there. Because that's what they need. We don't wait for them to fail the first time. We really want to meet them where they're at. So, and we really want to give them what they need. So we really want them to be successful. Um, so we really do, some of the training that we go through is, we do a lot of motivational interviewing, we do, do a lot of um, assessment trainings, we do a lot of case plan trainings, we do a lot of case plans with them based on their assessments, where they score high at their assessments, setting goals with them, personal goals. Um, we do a lot of safety trainings, um, home visit scenarios, we do home visits with them. Um, so we do a lot of what if this happens, what would you do? We have um, at the Sheriff's Department and the Police Department, we do <coughs> safety trainings where we have a house set up. And it's like a room where we really go in and we have actors. Um, a lot of it's state training where we go up to Denver. And we have a probation academy that we go through. Um, we have required training to require
Pasco County Sheriff's Office was offering jobs for attention deputies. And what's the first thing you look at when you look at the job fairs? It's on the far right hand side of the list. How much it pays. pays. Right, absolutely. How much it pays. And I looked at it at the time and said, well, it pays like 30, 38,000 a year. And I thought, well, that's enough to pay my bills. So you know what? I can make this work. What the heck? How, how bad is it going to be? So 2003, I was hired as a deputy sheriff. And everybody that we bring into the sheriff's office as a deputy are sworn peace officers. And a sworn peace officer means basically this. You have the exact same authority, everything that, everything that somebody out there driving a patrol car has. Okay? We certify you as a law enforcement professional, knowing that you're going to go work in a jail. But the cool thing about that is you're not necessarily limited to the jail. Now, my first thought when they interviewed me was, you know, you've got to spend two years in the jail on the last one. And I'll get out of there as soon as I possibly can because, again, I didn't raise my hand either and think, I want to work in the jail. Nobody does. However, I came in, and very much like the executive director said, I realized, you know, these are people. It's customer service. I was a customer service representative at a drug store. Okay? But what I found was those same exact skills were absolutely applicable in the jail. I was dealing with people. The only difference for me was they weren't wearing polo shirts. Now they were wearing jumpsuits. But did it change how, we, how I interacted with them? Absolutely not. 2007, I was, still a, I was still a deputy, four years in. And for those of you that have been in Colorado Springs, we ran into a massive overcrowding issue around 2004, 2005. We built a huge expansion on the jail. But what happened? You fill a jail, if you build it, they will come. Well, that's exactly what happened. And we had 1,100 inmates, we built, we built up a new tower, now all of a sudden we're approaching max capacity again. The only difference is now we have between 15 and 1,700 inmates. And of course, what do we want to do? We always want to ask the public, hey, can I have some more money to, make some, to build another jail? What does the public say? No. no, absolutely not. They will pay for a giraffe house to be refurbished to the zoo, but they will not pay for a jail. Okay? <laughs> and I say that because the reality is, is this. We had to start thinking outside of the box would say, how can we reduce our, reduce our inmate population? Solitary confinement doesn't work. The executive director was spot on with that. And that was kind of the old type of system that we too, even at the county level, had grown up in. It's what we knew, it's what we thought worked. So a group of deputies, myself being one of them, came up with something called the Reintegration Recovery Program. And very much like what they described here, we started getting into things as re re rehabilitative services. We're now actually a licensed facility with the goal of saying, you know what, yes, you made a bad decision, but if we're being completely honest, that we all made bad decisions, absolutely. But the difference is your bad decision landed you in jail. And for those of you that have had a chance to go through an internship or anything like that in the jail system, you'll know that many times they're required to take classes, they can't afford to take the classes, so what happens? A failure to comply with the orders of court, they go back to jail, and the process begins. It's what we refer to as a revolving door. But what if we can provide those classes to them in jail? Just a thought. And let's take it a step further. What if deputies teach them? Just a thought. Whoever thinks of a cop that gets in front of a bunch of inmates and teaches. We didn't, but we thought, you know what, let's push, push the envelope. There is a theme here amongst all of these is thinking outside the box. Get real when we talk about it. Water buffaloes, and I'll tell you, you're exactly right. I did the tour uh, two months ago with Lori Kilpatrick, I think, and what a cool thing. Water buffaloes. Who milks a water buffalo? Uh, not Scott, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but the, the reality is, is this you know what? It's thinking outside the box, and he's spot on. The coolest thing was when we took that tour was we were with the tour guy, Lori, but yet the inmates were coming out of their job to say, hey, come here, let me take a look, let me show you this. This is what I'm doing, this is how I'm doing. This is where the crawfish are, the tilapia farm is. It was cool, but it kind of piggybacked off of this thinking outside the box type of thing. They've taken it to a to a level we can only aspire and dream to be, but it starts with thinking outside the box. It starts with you, okay, our future, when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to corrections, saying, how can we make this better? And that's what we were looking for for our next generation. When I sit on world boards, for people that want to come to the El Paso County Sheriff's Office, Yes, you want to make the community a better place, but just something to think about. How do you want to make it a better place? Think about that. Get those, get those thoughts kicking around, and you know what, really, there are no ideas that are really not all that extreme. Our veterans are 
We had a high population of veterans within the El Paso County Criminal Justice Center. But here's the thing, what are, what are military service members used to? Structure. Okay. In the jail, they're used to maybe some kids that kids, inmates that don't have structure, and maybe some that do. They are not going to deviate, but we put them with people who have no structure whatsoever. We're setting them up for failure. We created a veterans board. Not because Scott had a great idea for a lieutenant, but because our deputies had these ideas and said, hey LT, I want to create a veterans board where they can have the type of structure they're used to in the service. It sets them up for success, and while they're in these boards, we're able to have people from the, from uh, from veteran services, veterans affairs, things of that nature, come in and provide them services they need for people. PTSD, giving them, helping them to arrange housing, living, and clothing options for when they get out of jail. That was the whole purpose. So I spent the first, oh, what was it, 10 years in detentions. Loved it. Thought I wanted to get out of it, and found out it was the last thing I wanted to get away from. However, they called me and they told me, Scott, you're going to IA. It's internal affairs. It's like the principal's office for cops. Okay? It doesn't matter really where you go, where you work. There's going to be professional standards. There's going to be something that the root is internal affairs, the principal's office. And that's where I spent the last four years. Did pretty well in our promotional process. And the under sheriff came and talked to me. He said, Scott, he's like, we're going to promote you. He's like, I'll give you any assignment you want to. Anything, any organization, it doesn't matter where you want to go. He said, promote me, put me back in the jail. And he about fell out of his chair. He said, Scott, no, you don't understand. If you want to go to patrol, you want to go to BNI, where would you like to go? I said, promote me and put me back in the jail. Because quite frankly, it is the best job going. But as the executive director said, you've got to have the right mindset for it. Yes, there are some bad people who have made some very bad decisions. But there are some people that we may not be able to help, but the reality is most of them, we absolutely can. But what we need is our future generation to be able to come up with these new ideas. We started with the RR program. Veterans Board's been around for three or four years. What's next? And that's what I'm asking you. Our jail, jail currently, we've got about 1,500 inmates. We keep them from minimum to maximum. It's an, all, it's an all adult facility. Minimum to maximum of that, one third of them have some form of recognized mental health issue. Does it pose a challenge? Absolutely. No question about it. Like I was talking about with regards to me working in a drugstore as a customer service representative, what do you need to have the ability to do? Here's a clue. It's not always fight. Because what's going to happen? Somebody else keeps coming. And it's one of you in a ward of 72. So there, there are probably some really bad people in here that are great at fighting. I'm not, okay, but what I'm pretty good at doing is talking. Okay, and that will help me work in a ward of 72 inmates. Who are behind bars, who are behind doors, and they're kind of like in a day room environment with bunk beds. Okay, and what we found is we need kind of a cooperative effort with them to get the job done. They need food, clothing, shelter, access to medical care, all of those things. And what do I need from them? I need you to be good. I need you to work with me. But the only way that we can do that is by, quite frankly, talking, communication, respect, thinking outside the box. How can we help them given an undesirable situation? They're very, very limited when it comes to that. That is what we are looking for for our deputies. We're looking for people that can think outside the box. Now, taking a little bit a step further from detentions, as I mentioned before, we will provide all the training for you. Okay? When you graduate our academy, you are a level one state certified peace officer in the state of Colorado, which opens up the doors for not only jail, but there are also working in the jail, but there are also portions within the detention bureau that we offer. Core services, providing courtroom security, transporting inmates from the jail to the court and back to DOC to other facilities, things of that nature there. Intake and release, bringing the inmates in, booking them in, running them in warrants, things of that nature. If your aspirations are patrol, name it, we got it. Patrol, canine, Joint, joint ventures with the ATF, Metro VNI, CSPD, FBI, Fugitive Task Force, you name it, we got it. It's not a problem. But it depends on where your interests lie. As I tell most of our new employees when they come in, the Sheriff's Office is a lot like Disney World. You can't do it all in a week. Okay, you cannot do everything that we have to offer in a career. At 25 ago, 25 years is what I had to do when I started in 2003. It seems like a lot of time. I'm halfway through it. 
what have I, what have I done? I've worked at the jail and I am. And man, I've had a great time. But there is so much to do despite what you want to do. And getting back to the job list, what's the number one thing everybody wants to look at when you see the job when you see the job here? <laughs> Bar right hand side, what was it? Remember? Hey, right, okay. We'll start you out at sixty thousand a year. Okay, thirty dollars, thirty dollars and some change a year. A top end deadbeats caps out right at about seventy. And that's just for that piece. Um, we have retirement, we have what we call the rule of seventy-five. Age plus time served has an equal seventy-five. After that, you typically walk away with about sixty-six percent of your uh, annual pay in retirement, and we pay for your benefits as well. Um, as far as education goes, you guys are one step ahead of the curve. We require a high school diploma. Obviously, there are some uh, things that kick you out as far as. Background checks, obviously, felony convictions, DV convictions, things of that nature there. But you're already one step ahead of most people that apply. Typically, our applicant pool will get 500,000. Most of them have GEDs or high school diplomas. You're already one step ahead. How many of you are doing the internship as part of your degree? Anybody? Okay, awesome. Uh, the Sheriff's Office, CSPD, or haven't started yet? Okay, no problem. Um, we have a lot of interns from UCCS come in. And get, a, get an idea of what it is that we do. And it's not just specific to the jail. We'll go through all the various bureaus, internal affairs, support services, training, personnel, the jail, things of that nature. But that being said, even if you're not signed up for it, as you prepare, as you get ready to graduate, now is the time to start looking, to start kind of laying the groundwork for your career in the future. After we finish up here, come on, grab a card form from me. I'll be glad to set you up with a tour. I can put you in contact with the right people. So they can get you the information so you can make a good decision. As I said, I had I had no aspirations of getting into law enforcement. I kind of lucked into the job, and it turned out to be one of the best things I've ever did. However, let's get you the information so you can make a good decision. Maybe maybe this will be the best place for you. Maybe not. But you know what? At least you'll be able to say yes or no when I had enough information to make a good decision. You may have any questions for me? Anything like that? Okay, that's all I got, guys. Thank you.
you know, communications or criminal justice or sociology, psychology, I think those really do help uh, because you're dealing with human nature. Can't always predict it. We work with people who do deserve definitely second chances and do take the second chances um, and you're there to kind of impose them to what, what choices they should make and how to help them um, if they want to be helped. There's a few that sometimes don't take that, um, but then that's where our law enforcement's come in. Because at the end of the day, we want to look for the community safety. We want to make sure all you guys are safe. So um, a typical day of parole for me kind of looks like go to the office. Um, it can be from an 8 to 5 shift. I can be there working on paperwork um, and leave at 5. And then there's a, other cases where I can be up till 2, 3 in the morning dealing with um, a severe case. Um, we get great training through the division, through the department. I think 40 hours is so easy to be met within probably three months. We have tons of awesome training. I just went to SOMB with uh, the sex offenders down in Breckenridge. Um, the department took care of us there and we got to learn more about that. Um, we work with probation. I, I know I'm constantly calling probations um, if our sex offenders on dual supervision, so if they have a probation case and a parole case, um, we work with that scope so much too. I mean, we're constantly there. Um, and we work with federal probation, I know as well. Um, and we really work with community resources. We have uh, our reentry specialists, where we really try to establish uh, some type of stable foundation for these offenders when they come out of DOC. Because again, we don't want to just throw them right back into the system. We want to give them some options of you know, dealing with some of their mental health, um, drug addictions. And again, um, I can't speak on how the division has changed. Um, all I know is that I came in when it was changing, when we were focused more on the evidence-based policies and practices, um, the MIs, really trying to figure out the root of the issue. Now, with my first year um, of parole under my belt, um, I decided to join and get back into school. Um, so I'm currently going here and attending my first semester in my graduate level classes for um, criminal justice and public administration because if there's the one thing I did notice within the year is that it's gonna continue to change. Um, again, we deal with human nature. We have to keep ourselves knowledgeable of what humans do and how to better assist them because uh, half these guys don't have the support system that we did. So where do we where do we step in? As the case manager and as a law enforcement, um, you know, we work with a lot of the sanctions where we don't necessarily just cuff them up there and take them back to jail because they came in and they were intoxicated or high on meth. Um, what we do is try to violate them or take things that mean something to them, but they give them back, right? So you know, you clearly are doing what you need to do on your free time. You're getting high on math, so how about we cut your curfew and put you in more treatment? Because we clearly can't have you on this community doing that, but we also need to address your uh, addictions. So you really have to think outside the box with dealing with these offenders, and this isn't just one person. We have a caseload of about 40, um, at least with us. And every individual is different. You have the very compliant ones, and then you have the ones that aren't compliant, and then you have the ones that become compliant, and then the compliant ones don't. So you really do have to modify the way you think. Um, and I really think getting an education and keeping yourself on tab with everything that's going around the world, um, the new evidence-based policies, all of that really does help and intertwines with you when you actually get out in the field. Um, for me, communication has been a huge thing. Um, you know, there's oftentimes I don't just deal with the sex offenders. I'll go out with my partners, and they happen to be on the gang unit. So, how are we going to take a situation that could be de deadly uh, when you're going into these houses and really communicate with the family members and maybe the six, seven guys that are also gang members, not on parole? So now you have two parole officers against a household of ten. How are your communication skills going to save you? Um, so it's crucial to have good communications. Uh, like as I said here, uh, you can't just go in there saying you're the biggest baddest, because uh, I'm clearly not. <laughs> I'm very opposite of that. Uh, but I have good communication skills, and I can really tell people to be direct with them, uh, not humiliate them, but really do get them to understand what to do and 
how it's going to be done, and then give them the opportunity to do it. Um, and really, then that does, it is your saving grace. Um, so it's been an exciting year. Uh, we'll see how the next year goes. I'm excited to start the program here and accomplish that, and hopefully one day be more uh, in the division. Um, again, that's another thing that, that just uh, I thought about, is that the way that the division's set up, you can move so many different positions. You don't have to stay with the control division. Um, there's so many different other places you can go, community reentry specialists. If you really do want to set these people up, um, for success, uh, that's crucial. Uh, we really, I don't know what we would do without the uh, community reentry. Um, we have our mental health, um, we have even our supervisors. I mean, all these roles inside the division is so much, and so there's so much variety there that you can really pick your niche and kind of follow that. Uh, but again, I remember sitting here and listening to people about three years ago, people that would also come and talk to us, and I never thought I'd be a parole officer. I thought I was going to stick with probation. Um, probation was a great way to start, though, because that's how I started. I went in there, learned the MI, learned the evidence-based policies, and they do a great job of training. Um, I did, again, I did it in Walton County, but I'm sure it's the same for, for all the counties that are similar. Um, and then when I interviewed for the parole division, that they asked the same questions, and I had fortunately been doing that for, for a while now, but um, we'll see where the next year takes me if I'm here again to talk. <laughs> Any questions? Um, I know I'm a little uh, closer on the graduation levels than you guys. Uh, I graduated in 2013, so uh, it's, it's tough. But if you, if you do want to get into this, I guarantee you just having an education and being able to say that, uh, employers like that because by getting that education, you really already have a concept of change. You know. That you're going to what you're going into, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with human nature. You can't just uh, pick pick a, a theme and say it's going to work. It doesn't. You're dealing with human nature, so those evidence-based policies and uh, practices are just crucial to dealing with uh, offenders, especially to help us. <laughs> sorry, this, I I was a little late, so I'm sorry about that. But any questions that any of you guys have? I think, sure. Um, I know in probation there was. Yeah. It was huge. I think that's what helped me get into it. Um, they ended up giving me all the DUI Hispanic uh, or Spanish speakers, and it was it worked great. Um, I haven't had to deal too much with that in parole. Just once in a while when we do the home visits, um, but other than that, not too much. But but in probation, I know there is. <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah. I mean, and, and the more diverse we can be as an organization, I mean, there's things that racial disparities that you all know is huge in the criminal justice system. You know, we used to say, in, in my world, well, we can't control who's sent to us, but a group of us got together nationally and said, well, that may be the case, but we can certainly do something with those that are sent to us. And so the better that we can reflect the community, the better, the better off we are. So there's a, there's a high demand for diversification in all areas.
reforming the use of solitary confinement. At that time, there were 1,500 people uh, in segregation, some for over 20 years, and that was a foul per capita, 7% of our population, which was one of the highest in the nation. So he began to look at why people were in solitary and found out, you know, the common mind that you hear from bureaucrats is those that are violent, that are too violent to be out in general population. But by the way, each of us in these bureaucracies have a catch-all. We have that, and then you read the policy further, and it says, and those too disruptive uh, to have an efficient uh, running of the institution or something like that. Well, that's every inmate I have, okay? So, he began reforms, and there was one individual um, that had spent seven years in solitary confinement, had some mental health issues, was a white supremacist gang member. The gang is a local Colorado gang called the 211 Gang. And he was released directly from solitary into the community. He, uh, and then the perfect storm started to form. He behaved, he had an electronic monitor on him. He behaved himself for a while, and he had a young woman purchase a handgun for him. He cut the monitor off. The alarm went off for six days with no one answering it. I'll explain that in a minute. And he then ordered a pizza. Uh, and when the, the media called the gentleman at pizza deliver, actually his name was Nathan Leon, who had a second job to improve, uh, and he to send himself to school to improve his, his family, he had several children. And when he showed up, the uh, uh, Evan Campbell, the uh, two other gang member, uh, had him tape a rambling statement about the evils of segregation or solitary or whatever you want to call it. Uh, murdered him, threw him in the trunk of his car, took his uniform, took the uh, pizza box, went to Mr. Clements' home, rang the doorbell, and uh, shot him in the chest, and he died in his wife's arms. He was then killed in a shootout uh, with Texas Rangers in, in Texas. Then to finalize the perfect storm, Determined that via a court clerical error, he was let out four years early. So, when the alarm went off for six days and I got here and I asked that question, and you can't justify that, but I could understand it when I heard the reason. The reason was that the parole division was getting over 14,000 false alarms per month. And I thought, well, how the heck was that allowed to happen? So I brought the, uh, the people that were in charge of those monitors in and said, well, basically, you've got one week to fix this, um, or you're done. And I'm going to go national on what we did, and we fixed it within a week. So, um, but what happened was, and what you have to understand in this business, it would have been very easy for the governor and the elected officials, because this is usually what happens when something like this happens, is they shut the place down, they go completely in the opposite direction, and they say, that's it, everybody's going to stay in solitary, we're going to stop these reforms, we're going to punish these people when they get there, that's what politicians do. Not these. I mean, it was, it was incredible that the governor and the legislators had the courage to say, keep this going forward, and, and that's, what, that's what I was charged with. So um, today, less than 1% of our population is in solitary. Uh, those going in, know when they're coming out, the absolute maximums a year, we're the only state in the nation that does that. Um, and even that's for those that uh, have committed a serious offense like homicide. We're the only state in the nation that has passed a statute that um, does not allow those that are classified as seriously mentally ill to be placed into solitary. Um, and I gotta tell you, and, and the deputy here will probably uh, have a higher number, but over, so you understand my population, 77% are addicted to drugs and or alcohol, over 30% have a mental illness of some type, over 12% are seriously mentally ill, and they come in at about the seventh grade um, education level. So. So that's what, uh, that's what we're dealing with, and that's what we stress with our staff is that's how you have to address these people is, under, is understanding that uh, that's, how they, that's how they come in. So um, that's, the, that's the story, and we 
we haven't done that uh, since we haven't released anybody directly from solitary into the community since 2014. Um, we are one of the only, if not the only, state that does that. Um, there are some states that still release thousands from solitary uh, directly into the community. And to show you how bureaucracies can get out of control, and I'm going to push this as hard as I can because when you join one, I need you to really look at, at what we're doing with a different set of eyes. I've been here a very short period of time, and my deputy came to me with a form. And I said, what's this? And she said, well, under Colorado law, if the state hospital determines that someone is too violent to be in the state hospital, they send them out. I said, have they been convicted of a crime? No. Ever? Or maybe sometime, but not this time. How many do we have? Well, if we take this one, it'll be five. And coincidentally, this individual had just turned 18, which tells me they were waiting for the day he turned 18 to send him to us. He was a big 18-year-old, had been in and out of institutions since he was like, uh, about five years old. Uh, his dad, when he was 15, used to take him to bars to fight for money. Um, he was operating at about the four or five-year-old level. And on this form was a yes or no box. And I said, what happens if I, if I sign no? He said, nobody's ever done that before. I said, give me a pen. And I signed no. And as it went through the bureaucracies, if it takes about three days to do that, my phone started ringing. And I was informed, not so politely, that it didn't matter if I signed no, uh, because by law, I had to take him anyway, and we did. So now it was um, patient, and I stress the word patient, number five, in our system. And the trouble is that when someone enters our system, they were treated as an inmate. Obviously, that's what we have. We have inmates in our, in our prison. Now, can you imagine being at the level of a four or five year old in a cell? What would happen to you? Well, he ended up in solitary confinement. And he had tantrums. And we have a very professional staff that was following the rules. And the rules were stair step um, action that they took to have some comply with orders. How many four or five year olds comply with orders? So ultimately, he was being gassed about four times a day. And I went to the governor's office and I said, one, I question the constitutionality of this, but if it is constitutional, it is immoral. And so they agreed. I worked with the director of human services. We worked with the legislature. We worked with the ACLU. And, uh, and we were able to ban, statutorily ban that practice. But, but again, what, what if we weren't here? I mean, it's, it'd still be going on. And how can, how can you allow something like that to happen? So uh, that's a you know, very quick background of the changes that have, that have happened. And a lot of that were driven um, by the assassination. You know, today, I can obtain anything I want, probably about anybody in this room. Um, I happen to have my home is not under my name. Uh, my license plates on my vehicle are not under my name. I have a false identification that by state law um, has to be accepted by every business in the state of Colorado. And I'm pretty sure that if someone wants to get my name, they're going to get it. And they're just going to go on the internet. And, uh, and they're going to find it. Um, there's, there's so many public records nowadays. For us in public service, we're just we're sitting in that fishbowl, and uh, uh, it's very unfortunate. But um, you know, you can, you can Google our houses. You know, I mean, it, it's just uh, it's it's difficult. It's difficult um, to hide identities in today's age. this great group of people here, I could spend five hours talking to you about mass incarceration and programs that I want. I could talk about architectural suffering, if you're interested in that, that's the latest thing I'm starting to work on. Um, if you don't know what that is, I've had the opportunity now as, as sheriff, uh, when I was sheriff of Dane County, to move people by employees from an absolute dump into a nice building. Recently, I was able to move my headquarters from an absolute dump where um, we had flooded out twice last year, where there was mold, where there were bugs, where
were, you wouldn't want to drink the water when it was running, and there were a lot of times it wasn't running, and I moved them into a very nice office. The results were remarkable. Um, dressed better, acted better, worked harder, uh, personalities improved, smiled, laughed, enjoyed each other's company. And so, I, have any of you been to Canyon City? Okay, and you go out there from Colorado Springs and you go over the, over the hill, and as you go over the hill, you look down and you go, holy smokes, these big concrete monsters are sitting there. Think of being an inmate in a prison bus, going over the top of that hill, seeing those monsters, you instantly become an inmate. And you better be the baddest, worst inmate there is because those buildings are so threatening that you better be bad or something bad's gonna happen to you. So when I talk about architectural suffering, um, you know, I've been in the European system and and uh, spoke with, uh, they call him, a warden in Norway is called governor. I had a chance to be on a panel uh, on an international forum with him. And uh, he runs a maximum security prison. In fact, the prison where that gentleman that got on that island and murdered all those people is, is there. It's got a, obviously a big wall around it, but uh, their yard, uh, the place where they recreate the stuff, there's hills and, and trees. And, and someone in the audience said, well, what happens if an inmate climbs a tree? I know what would happen in my system. They'd order them to come down. And if they didn't, they'd get the beanbag gun out, and they'd let them have it. Norway warden said, well, we wait for him to climb out of the tree. And, and so that's our difference in philosophy. So, but what we would say, what I would say is, it's a different culture. That's why they can treat people differently in Europe. But I think because of our architecture of these prisons, is that we're responsible for some of that culture. I believe those facilities manufacture violence. And so nobody wants to build new prisons anymore, including me. I'd like to tear some down. But, but if some need to be replaced and you get into these types of positions, fight hard to have a prison that is much more easier on the eyes than one that spells violence just by the way it's built. That's my new, that's, that's where I'm going now. That's my new uh, vision is to try and get these prisons a little bit more user friendly. And I gotta tell you, um, and, uh, the professor shut me up any time. But, uh, you know, I was out in one of our, our minimum security facilities where I walked through, and it's out in the middle of nowhere. And I, I, I talked to these inmates, and I'm thinking, why don't you just go home? I mean, they, they're getting out in seven months. They, they're doing well. Uh, they don't need to be there. The law requires that they be there. But anyway, I thought, well, if you're going home in seven months, why don't we put them in street clothes? Why don't we get the authority to have their families um, meet us at the closest town and take them to lunch or take them to dinner, get them start getting them interacting again with their families, possibly giving them furloughs so that they can that they can get themselves a little bit more centralized into the community. And so I was introduced to a, a, a correction officer who I was told when I was introduced, she's one of our best, most experienced correction officers. So I said to her, Well, you know, since you're so good, how about if we put them in uh, civilian clothes? Oh! <laughs> Can't do that. Why? Well, if you put them in civilian clothes, the minute they step off our grounds, they'll blend in with the surroundings. I said, where are they going to go? It's out in the middle of nowhere. And I said, well, what about if we got them decent tables and, and chairs instead of these plastic things that are laying here? Oh, no, can't do that. Why not? Well, they're told they can't iron on that table and the they do, and the table's all chipped up, and I thought, well, maybe if it wasn't this junky looking for my good table that takes some ownership in it, you wouldn't do that to it. Um, so, so that's where I think corrections in America is, is going to be heading, is more towards the European type system. Now, to do that, I've said in Europe, they invest in corrections. In America, we invest in efficiency. Our staffing level, I've got 175, and Deputy to say to the the same, uh, 175, 180 in Europe. To become a correctional officer in Norway, for instance, you are in school for two years, being paid by the devil. And then after that, then you get into a mentoring program in the facilities for, for another lengthy period of time, and then you're a full going correctional officer. In Sweden, they have um, these wonderful break rooms because they have enough staff that they can actually give them a break. Our break rooms are called control centers. Uh, they consist of watching all the inmates, and you'll see a, a bag of Doritos and a liter of Coke, and they're going, my God, you know, what? how can we treat these people better?
better, but if I treated them the way that uh, uh, the European government treats their employees, I'd be fired. They wouldn't tolerate that. They treat them too nice. They give them too many things. And, and that's the uh, investing in corrections versus investing in, in efficiency. But their staffing is about almost one to one if you add everybody together. And what happens with that, which they will never do in this country, I don't think, they don't want to invest in us. What happens with that is the inmates attach themselves to the staff. Here, inmates attach themselves to inmates, because that's who they mingle with most of the day, instead of our, instead of our corrections staff. Uh, so, if you were able to change the layout of a prison, what would you change it to? I mean, how would you? Okay, there isn't, there isn't anybody in my position that wouldn't love to blow their prison system up. And the reason why is because um, you don't put prisons where prisons should be. You put prisons where the strongest legislator can lobby hard enough to get jobs into their community. And so they're stuck out in the middle of nowhere, a good number of them was. You know, in Wisconsin, um, which has, here's little Midwest Wisconsin, has the highest rate of incarcerated disparity rate. Um, they were second United States, now they're number one, I think. But, but you'd have a prison in far northern Wisconsin where, one, there were very few African Americans, and except for those in prison. And the staff coming from a little community was all white that had never had a lot of interaction with, with the, uh, the black culture. And so you can imagine the, the, tension, the tension there. But if I could design a prison today, I would design it in such a way that as the lieutenant said, um, these are people, and they treat them like that, because you're going to get treated the same way you treat folks, so that you give them ownership in things. And, you know, in, in Europe, um, what they do, they, they had all the problems we used to have, the riots, the stabbings, the killings. Uh, the government ordered white papers done, and those white papers determined that the direct cause of what's happening here is the way we're treating inmates. And so they changed everything. And, and what they changed was they understood that what they took away from an inmate was the greatest thing that can ever be taken away from a human being, and that's their freedom. After that, they work to, um, they understand people commit errors. That's what human beings do. We make mistakes. Some are grave mistakes, obviously, but, but uh, um, you design a facility that's more user-friendly, that's more conducive to um, rehabilitation, more conducive, spend more time with re-entry. You know, at our mental health facilities, when we got rid of solitary, what we did was we made, we built two de-escalation rooms. Um, these rooms are, are soft colors, there's music being piped in, there's, there's comfortable chairs, there's the stress balls, there's a blackboard if they want to write things. These mentally ill inmates that used to go off like a bomb, now go up to a staff member and say, I need a time out. And they go into these rooms, it, by, it's all voluntary, they go in and they come out and they're ready to come out. And so I, we, we need more of that. We need, um, you know, I was walking through our, our repurposed supermax. Um, uh, now, you know, people are out and about, they're using the gyms, they're talking, they're, they're mingling. Um, but I'm looking at the walls, there's nothing on them. And, you know, a number of our facilities, we have some excellent artists. We have some excellent everybody, actually, they just kind of drifted off in a different direction. But, but uh, uh, the murals are beautiful. And I said, well, why, why aren't we having them sign You know, I haven't signed these things so people know who it is that did that. But I'm looking at all these walls going, you know, we can do, I can't soften a super match too much, but I can brighten it. You know, I can give it a better environment. I can have the lights better. Uh, you know, they never had TVs. We've got those out. Uh, I knew we could, I could declare victory when I when I went out to the supermax after we let everybody out. And um, um, the main question I had going to every single unit was, when are we going to get a microwave? And because supermax aren't required for microwaves, so it's it's understanding that punishment doesn't work. I don't try and change a victim's thoughts. They've had some horrific things done to their families. There are some that want that inmate chained to a car and driven down a gravel road at 90 miles an hour. I get that. They, I, I don't even try and change that. The, the sole reason for why I'm doing the things that we're doing and the reason my staff is 
It is for a safer community because we don't want more victims. We simply have to change the way these people do business. And as I told my staff, we know what hasn't worked for 100 years. Let's try some things that, that might work. And if they don't, we can always go back to the way we were. So having facilities that are just more comfortable on the eye. You know, I, I, I've used the term soft, and I thought, well, that's pretty politically incorrect. I'll be fed that for lunch. Um, I can give you a great example of that, too. But, but uh, uh, in fact, I will, because it's kind of funny. Uh, we, don't, we don't have a death row anymore. Um, death row inmates in most states are locked up forever, 23 hours a day. Um, the only state that regularly kills people is Texas now, um, because they have a system that allows it to be a sped up system. Our system here um, takes years and millions of dollars to execute someone, and gratefully, um, I have a governor that said, you know, because when you look at who's being executed in Colorado, it's not pretty, it's, it's mainly minorities. And, and uh, uh, so anyway, um, when we got rid of death row, um, the, uh, their attitude changed 180 degrees, which meant my staff was safer, but we had this newsletter and we were talking about it, and, Corrections term is, is leisure time. And so when we described it in the newsletter that they were being let out for four hours and a certain amount was programming and a certain amount was leisure time, guess what political opponent picked that up during the governor's race at? And he, he just he had a field day. And uh, you know, the next thing was bomb bombs on the porch or on the couch or something. But anyway, um, you know, I mean it, it's really thinking the way we do business. It's like with solitary, does it work? And we kind of touched on it. It doesn't. And when I was asked by a, a, a reporter once on why it doesn't work, why I actually asked me, does it work? And I said, no. Um, I said, you got to understand how they get in there. Is that there's two ways um, that they get in there. One is reactionary, which is what got them into prison, and a lot of them to begin with, is that without thinking, they commit an act. So it doesn't matter the consequence. And the other way you get in there is they do something planned. So they know what the consequences are, and it doesn't matter. And so that just tells me we need to do a, a better way of doing business. Plus, after what I've seen, and who I've heard talk, and the many discussions I've had, extended solitary confinement manufactures and multiplies mental illness. I've, I've been on a lot of panels with a psychiatrist, Craig Haney, out of California. Yeah, he has spent his career studying long-term isolation. And he told me that those that are in isolation for long periods of time, he has only found their mental state in one other group of people, the degree of loneliness. Long, uh, it's a terminal cancer patient. Think of that. And then we let him out. Woohoo, nothing good's going to happen to them. So, a much, a much user-friendly try to fix them instead of just
It's the thought of helping them change their lives. And then them getting out in society and becoming productive members of the they're powerful messengers for the other people that they interact with. Because I'm confident that I apply it to a former inmate who has turned his life around. He doesn't stop with himself. He does it with everyone he interfaces with. And so I think as we promote and do more of that, that this long-term policy, by the way, uh, the joke I always have is, is that literally I think everybody here at the table is working to try to get themselves out of a job. I mean, seriously. I mean, that's our goal. Wouldn't it be fantastic? 5,000 people out of 10 million. Wow. Wow, is all I can say about that. That would be fantastic. So, uh, if you're looking for inspiration, I will tell you that this career, there's going to be bad stuff and there's going to be problems. We know that to deal with human beings. But the good stories outweigh the bad every day. I have a question for this one here. Are you looking at bringing that in? Wisconsin, we had kind of a hybrid where there was, there, there was discipline, but it was more programming. Um, that would be something that uh, I wouldn't mind bringing back. We have a, a kind of a vacant facility within a facility where we used to run it and then just, just stop it. Shown with an officer, that's a husband can talk probably more about this, but it's been shown that that Crowley's, for instance, need four positive reinforcements and each negative reinforcement that they get to succeed. And, and what I would like her to do is, to, if you don't mind, is to talk a little bit about the changes. And I can give you the background, which is I, I've got some great role officers, they're really good, but they were taught. Seventy percent of them were, and the point is, is that when I got here, the recidivism rate was about fifty percent. So I'd walk into a prison, I'd, a prison a room full of inmates, and I'd say, "You got to prove my data wrong." And they'd say, "What?" I'd say, "Yeah, you're coming back." Well, thirteen percent of that recidivism rate was from those committing new crimes within three years. That's a really good goal. That's excellent. The rest were technical parole violations, which meant that. The parole officers were sending these people back to prison for like dirty ways and having a big mouth and things of that nature. And that's the way they were taught and that's the way they were trained. So, you know, we hired people um, like Officer Gonzalez that I'm really familiar with us. It's, it's, um, it's a changing attitude, and the attitude is I'm here to help you to succeed. That's my job. And uh, so it's more of a tough law, I guess, would be a good, would be a good term, because they're held accountable, and that's inmates, too, and, and uh, you know, very quickly when you talk, of, when you hear about that pipeline of prison and stuff, when I was secretary of, in Wisconsin, if you started high school in Milwaukee, 50% of those starting high school dropped out. 50% of the prison population in Wisconsin came from Milwaukee. Which, and I sarcastically and cynically said, when drop out of school is just put them on a bus, take them to prison, and cut out the middle person called the victim. Uh, and that's the importance of keeping, keeping these kids in school. And just to back up a little bit about what Mr. Rainer stated, um, I think it's crucial for, for new people coming into a division or agencies to have the education that you guys have. Um, when I came in, we were trained that way to be big tough parole officers. Um, I've only learned the way of giving them alternatives. I can't 
cognitive education. My bachelor's degree is understanding that, okay, I'm dealing with humans, I'm not dealing with inmates, I'm not dealing with offenders. I have to take that category out of my mind. I'm dealing with humans, and what is it causing them to get into the system? What, what's not causing me to go into the system? Why have I never been into that issue? Well, I don't have a lot of these um, issues such as structures or um, mental health. I don't have them. So now I'm in a position where I get to work with these offenders being positive members of the community. And, you know, again, sometimes it's a little more difficult on a certain individual. Um, you have to work a lot more than the other uh, person that's going to come in after him. But we really have to take a step back and realize what's not working. Clearly go back and in, back out and in again into that DOC isn't working. So uh, you hope to be the one that addresses the rooted issues such as mental health, such as um, drugs and alcohol. I just keep going back to that because that's a lot of what we see. You're always under the influence when you commit these crimes. So how about we address the under the influence issue? So then when you come out, you no longer have to commit the crimes. Um, so it, it's been really good. I think uh, uh, people coming into the divisions or agencies with the higher education have uh, a good concept of that, that you're dealing with people and humans, um, and then continuing to uh, get your education after well year and I think has helped me even just my starting my first semester here at UCCS. Um, everything leads up and, and you get a, a really good understanding of what exactly you are doing there. Um, but yes, any other questions? I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of Officer Gonzalez. Um, one of the things when I was an officer uh, with my clientele, um, I supervised sex offenders, and they had nothing to lose. So they were going to prison. They were tender lifers. Um, they had nothing to lose, so they were going back and forth. Um, so it wasn't like a hot UA, you filed for revocation um, of probation, and you went back to court. Um, one of the things was you worked with them, and you worked with them, and you worked with them. You really did try to find a root of the problem. The reason because of this, not only because you are working with people, they are going to get out. They are going to come back to, into the community. They are going to meet your neighbors. Um, they're going to come back on parole. But also because when you file the revocation, you're going, these are sex offenders, or these are clients, these are people's lives. Are you going to feel okay recommending prison for someone? And not only that, but you have to go to court. And with sex offenders, they always take it to trial because they have nothing to lose. So you file a complaint, and I know this was my experience, you file a complaint and you're having to testify. And are you going to feel comfortable getting on that stand with a public defender or an attorney cross-examining you and are you going to feel comfortable saying that you have tried everything with that client? And I don't know about you, but I want the judge and the attorneys to respect me. And I want to know that I've done everything that I could. I've used every community resource. I've done everything that I could for my client to help them change and make a huge behavior change for them. And if I hadn't, I don't think I'd feel comfortable recommending to someone go to prison and be in a cell or someone you know then get out and be on parole for the rest of their lives um, so when my officers now give me a complaint to sign off before it goes to court before it goes to the judge I'll look at it and I'll say have you done this and I've always used to ask them like what's your gut tell you yeah you know, I, I felt it in my gut. I knew when I was working harder than they were. I knew when I was like, I'm done. It's like at this point, I'm working harder than they are. And so I'll give the complaint back to my officers and I'll say, can you try this or have you tried this? Or come staff a case with me. Or my officers will staff cases with each other a lot because there's a lot of, um, there's so many resources in Colorado Springs for mental health, for substance abuse. 
there's so many different officers have so many different strengths and they, they share so many different great ideas and so many different out of the box thinking because each individual is so different and each individual sanctions and incentives are so different and what other officers have tried other officers may not have even thought of and so by stacking it with each other they really just I think come up with some great ideas and different resources to provide those clients. So, I mean, really, we also use court. I mean, we're, I'm trying to get my officers not to go to court as much, but you spend a lot of time in court. A lot of the judges require you to be in court. Um, I don't see it as effective. I'm trying to get, I'm meeting with our judges so that my officers are not in court sitting there. I think that they're more effective in their office meeting with their clients. However, some judges disagree. They want them there for every single formal proceeding. Um, but you're in court a lot, and you're having to testify a lot, and you're having to stand there and give your recommendation. And do you feel comfortable? If you haven't tried everything with that client, recommending that they go to prison, or that they recommend that they serve a year in jail, and then go to South Street for two years and spend time away from their family, you know, is that the treatment that they need? So, again, meeting with them individually, finding out what their needs, their risk levels are, finding out what those pro-social strengths are. If they have a positive support system at home, they really don't, they really may not benefit from a two-year program, maybe a nine-month program of substance abuse treatment. Would you really want to refer them to a two-year Stout Street program in Denver? know and take them away from their job and their family maybe something less you know, so really identifying what they have going well for them and then finding their risk level and finding that specific treatment but again finding out what works best for them but I also I did leave out the court part I did want to identify that you are in court a lot giving your recommendation and I think that's important when you're thinking about sending someone to prison making sure you're utilizing all of your options
to my office and show me the progress they've done. And I have so many guys show me their homework that they're doing and the raises that they've done. So you really do give them meaning type to life, um, which is, I think, the, the way to really help them establish um, their foundation in the community. Um, and again, you, you know, you might have the one or two that are a little more difficult, but it's really, really thinking, what is causing you? What's the root issue of this um, outbreak you're having? Why, why are we not going the right direction? Where are we going back? Um, so, yeah. I know some of you have a class in the next 15 minutes, so I want to extend a great thank you for our panel members for taking the time from their busy schedule. You all, as participants, are going to be, at some point, hopefully, in the future, up there where they are now. And I told you I retired many years ago, and after I retired, we brought uh, Marcy and Travis on. The bottom line, because they are two of the best in the business. When I got Marcy's back when I started looking at it, making contacts, making calls, following up, very impressive. That's why she's in the position that she's in now. Same with Travis. Same with everyone else here. Next week, we have an internship panel. Some of the same group will be here. October 11th, you've heard the correction side of the administration. On October 11th, we're fortunate to have an offender panel come in. We will be here with a group of parolees, community inmates. Uh, so you'll have a chance to hear their experiences within corrections, whether it's probation, parole, supervised release, imprisonment, and so on. So on October 11th, in this uh, facility, from uh, 1030 to 130, again, we have the offender panel coming in. So again, a great thank you to panel members. Thank you for participating. I did pass along a sign-up sheet. If you have not signed that, I have it on my table. Again, stick around for our panel members.